today we are in the third part of this sermon series on fear. Fear is a primal, deeply felt, pivotal emotion inside of us that affects the way that we live our lives and often the way that we live out our faith. So far in the series, we've talked about the biological and scriptural origins of fear. Last week, we talked about what it's like to live in our current culture, which sometimes feels like it's fear-based, like our brains and bodies are so constantly bombarded with fear stimuli that we live at this constant kind of low-level grade of fear. And that leads us to today, where we're talking about rational versus irrational fear. In other words, we're talking about what should we be afraid of. First, I want to reiterate the fact that it is okay to be afraid sometimes. While I know most of us as parents in the room have told our children not to be afraid or there's nothing to be afraid of, the reality is that there are plenty of things for us to be afraid of in the world. Fear itself is not a bad thing. I know sometimes we lump fear and sadness and anger into a bucket of negative emotions, but really those are still useful things. Those emotions, while we may not always like them, are part of the human experience. Fear keeps us on our toes. Fear keeps us alive in dangerous situations. Believe it or not, fear can even be fun sometimes. That's why we're bold enough to get on a roller coaster every once in a while and no matter what else happens in this sermon, you've got a great roller coaster pantomime, and that's what you need to take home with you today. But whether it's watching a horror movie or walking through a haunted house, sometimes we enjoy that feeling of being a little afraid, followed by laughter. Sharing a scary experience can actually bond people more closely together emotionally. But as I said in the first sermon of the series, we can get out of balance in our fears. And sometimes our fears can get to the point where they control us, where we're afraid to move forward or backward, where we're afraid to truly live or live out the calling that God has placed upon our lives. And we can also fear irrational things. Fear conditioning is a name that psychologists give to talk about when we Fear something that is not threatening, but it becomes so dread-inducing that it paralyzes us. I remember uh, my grandfather telling us the story of when he was a boy being bit by a dog while he was out playing. The concern of this dog bite was about rabies, which untreated is fatal, so he was taken to his doctor immediately. And today, the rabies vaccine is a series of shots that's kind of like getting the flu shot. You get a couple of round of shots and you're deltoid and everything's okay. But in the 1920s, it was a series of 21 painful shots in the stomach. It was incredibly painful. And that combination of the dog bite and the painful treatment created in my grandfather a conditioned fear of all dogs that lasted for much of his life. Now the thing about most conditioned fears is that most of them fade over time through natural relearning. This was the case with my grandfather when he was in his 60s. We had to leave our family dog with him while we moved. Uh, he, our dog stayed there for about eight weeks. And when we went back to pick up the dog, my grandfather cried because he had grown to love that dog so much while, he lived, while she lived in their house. The man who hated dogs for most of his life learned that he could love a dog. You know, this happens in other ways, too. Most of you adults in the room are probably no longer scared of the dark, as you were perhaps when you were a child. Many of you have a natural, and I would say reasonable, unease around clowns, but most of you don't cry anymore when you see one. But sometimes we don't relearn. Sometimes our rational fear gets a hold of us, and it just won't let go. They control us in big ways and small ways, we had a neighbor growing up, Mrs. Peavy, and Mrs. Peavy was terrified of driving over big, tall bridges. She had to have a neighbor, a friend, a family member drive her over the big, scary bridges that were all, we lived in St. Petersburg, Florida. You can't get anywhere without going over a bridge. But it was a crippling fear that she never got over. So what are you afraid of? What is it that gets a hold of you and won't let go? 
Is it heights or airplanes, sharks, death, rats, mice, snakes, terrorists? Most of what we fear is nonsense. And by nonsense, I mean that literally. It's nonsensical. It doesn't make sense. It is irrational that we are so afraid. Because like we talked about last week, we are the authors of our own worst fears. We create unlikely, improbable, vivid, terrifying, worst-case scenarios of our greatest fears. When it comes to some irrational fears, you can control a lot of that through avoidance. If you don't like public speaking, don't become a preacher. If you don't like airplanes, don't travel. If you don't like elevators, you can take the stairs. But we all have fears that we can't avoid, right? I mean, the number one one is death. We're afraid of death. Now, most people who fear death, though, don't fear normal death. The top five ways that human beings in America die today are heart disease and cancer and respiratory diseases, accident, stroke. Now, if you are really, really scared of death, you will be much more concerned about missing exercise or what you eat on a daily basis. But most of the people in here, when they get their blood test from their doctor and they see their HDL and LDL, as I did from David earlier this week, go, ah, what are you going to do? Pass me another donut, you know? Most of us don't fear that kind of death. We fear exotic, scary, nightmare fuel death. Terrorists, murderers, sharks, plane crashes, snake bites, coronavirus. And look, those things are real. And I'm not trying to minimize the fact that there are people that have lost their lives to those things. People do die from those things. But your chances of being personally affected or impacted by that kind of exotic death is effectively zero. And yet for some of you, every time you wade into a pool at night, you hear it. Dunna, dunna, dunna in a chlorine pool. Now, you know how many people die from shark attacks in the ocean, not in a pool, in, in the U.S. every year? One person every other year. A half a person a year. On average, I know, the sharks, the other, the other half is in the shark. Yeah, okay. On average, uh, we already talked about that. Do you know what kills more people than sharks every year? Ants, horses, cows, deer, hippopotamuses. <laughs> 2,900 people a year, if you didn't know that, it's dangerous. We don't have them here, so you're good. Do you know the top animal killers in the world? Dogs, 25,000 people a year, but we've got good rabies vaccine, so that doesn't apply to you. Mosquitoes, 725,000 people a year. But we don't have malaria, so you're pretty safe. Bees, wasps, hornets. If you're not allergic, you're good. If you are, sorry. Most dangerous animal to human beings? Other human beings. You are more likely to be killed by the person sitting next to you than anybody else. I hope you chose wisely. Now that you are armed with all of this vital statistical information that I have given you, I know that none of you are ever going to fear going into the ocean again, and you can thank me later. But sadly, no, we have to face the fact that relearning takes time and intentionality and practice. This is something that we have to work at. You have to take baby steps toward understanding what we are afraid of and conquering those fears. Fear, whether it is rational or irrational, can paralyze us. The author, uh, Brene Brown, says this is called emotional high centering. It's like getting your car stuck on a car median and your wheels spinning on either side. You can't go anywhere. This happens to us. It happens in Scripture. In the story of the disciples, after Jesus' crucifixion and before the resurrection is revealed to them, the disciples get caught in that upper room in Jerusalem. They're terrified. They're afraid of the Jews. They're afraid to move forward or backward. And it's not until Jesus enters into their midst and says those glorious words that we've heard again and again in this, in this series, peace be with you. Do not be afraid that they are able to move 
for us. We see a similar paralysis in today's very famous passage from Genesis, the story of David and Goliath. The passage we read talks about the Jewish armies and the Philistine armies encamping on either side of a valley, on mountains on either side. They are at a stalemate. They cannot move forward. They are terrified to enter into the valley because they know that they will lose the high ground. If they lose the high ground, they will lose the battle. So there are small skirmishes, but no one is willing to make that leap into a full-fledged battle. They're stuck. They're afraid. And it's at this point that Goliath gets sent down by the Philistines. And Goliath is terrifying. This nightmare of a man that shows up to break the stalemate through one-on-one combat that will decide the fullness of the battle. And apparently the only thing more terrifying than a whole army dying on this battlefield is anyone being willing to go in and face Goliath. There are no volunteers. No tribute can be found when Saul asks, for a volunteer, everybody does that third grade thing when the teacher asks a question that no one knows the answer to, they all look down. That is until little David, who's too young to even be a page or a shield bearer, walks up because he was given a chore to do by his father to take bread and cheese to his brothers, who were the real fighters, and to King Saul. He shows up and evaluates the situation. He looks down into the valley at Goliath and he says, what is the big deal? What is the hubbub? Hub? We have got God on our side. That is just an uncircumcised yellow-bellied Philistine. He should be scared of us. Now you and I and David's brothers and probably the whole of the Jewish army probably thought David was crazy. He takes it even further though and he volunteers. He says, I'll, I'll go down. Why on earth is he so bold? You know, we often look at the story as a great underdog story of the underdog taking down the champion. But the author, Malcolm McDowell, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, excuse me, McDowell's a whole another messed up actor. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell uh, says that this is a fundamentally misunderstood story. He says, this is not an underdog story. This is a story of a young man who is confident in his abilities. You see, at no point in this chapter from 1 Samuel do we ever get a hint that that David is afraid. You might call that hubris or foolishness or being young and dumb, but the author of 1 Samuel doesn't portray David this way. David volunteers. And not in a self-destructive kind of way, not a suicide mission kind of way. He tells Saul, look, I keep sheep for a living. It's what I do. I am good at what I do. I face lions and bears all the time. A child, he faces lions and bears all the time. They come in, they try to steal my sheep. You know what I do? I strike that bear or lion down. I rescue the lamb. Oh, and if it tries to get up off the mat and come back at me again, I grab it by the jaw, I hit it again, I kill it dead. This guy, Goliath, he's just another bear. He's just another lion. That's some bold, cold-blooded stuff right there from a little kid, isn't it? David is not playing. He knows what he has seen, what he has faced, what he has endured and survived in his life. And in his eyes, being scared of Goliath just isn't rational. Send me down. No armor, no sword, no shield, no sweat. Just give me what I know how to use, and God will be with me. And you know how the story ends. Wham, bang, right between the eyes. I want you to just take just a minute and inventory your life. What have you struggled through? What have you survived? What have you risen above in the course of your years on this land? You know, I have the benefit of being invited into the personal stories of a lot of people by virtue of being a pastor. I know what is present in this room, what some of you have endured in this life, Some of you have beaten back cancer two and three times. Some of you have lost your job and lost everything and rebuilt your life from the bottom up. 
Some of you have lost loved ones. Some of you have seen relationships in. Some of you have come from foreign countries and built a life here. Some of you have beaten crippling addiction. You have escaped abuse. You have lived through war. But you are alive today. And you are better prepared for what life throws at you. God has given you skills and abilities and experience that allow you to face the next hurdle. Knowing that God is with you. That God has seen you through everything so far, and he is still with you now. You are better prepared for what the world throws at you than you have ever been before in your life. You are prepared for what lies ahead. The question is, is what you fear going to keep you from being the person that God is calling you to be? From taking that next step? Is some irrational nonsensical thing going to keep you stuck where you are or can you with the confidence that God is with you walk down into that mouth with all the skills and power that God has given you and take on something worthy of your fear I'm not promising you're going to win every battle we know that that's just not true you may win you may lose but either way God is with you and I want to remind you of something that we understand in this New Testament reality that we live in, that David didn't understand. David knew that God, Yahweh, was with him. But here in this New Testament world that we live in, this resurrection reality that we live in, we know that we never walk alone. That we are brave enough, bold enough to invite people into the hardships that we face. We are never alone. God is with us most certainly, yes. But guess what? All of these people around us are with us as well. We have to be reminded of that sometimes, don't we? And all the disagreement and schism and, and heartbreak that can happen in the life of a church, that, that we're all on the same side. We're all in this together. We're all on the side of God and love and grace and forgiveness and we get to be with one another. If you're walking into the valley alone, it's because you've chosen to. If you're bold enough, brave enough to say, I am struggling and I am facing the greatest battle of my life and I don't want to do this alone, that's our job. That's why we are here as the body of Christ to remind every single person wherever they are in their life whatever stage of life they're in that they don't have to do this alone we walk into the valley of the shadow of death with you you are surrounded by the love and prayers of the body of Christ more assuredly than anything else in the 